to say, and I wonder if you would say this, that it wasn't just your personal experience, but that there was also a what we would call, what I would call, there was an agenda that you started to believe for why you should transition. So it wasn't just your personal experience, but that perhaps you also listen to some of the voices in our culture that are putting pressure upon people to to assume an identity that may not necessarily be their identity. Would you say that that's fair, that, that there's a cultural agenda that perhaps that you started to, to listen to in terms of transition surgery? Well, sure. Um, you know, here, here's the thing, is that I, I never fit in. Even in yeah. the, the gay and lesbian community, I never fit don't. in there because I was, um, I was not a butch lesbian. I was a business, so I had to do it again. Um, and so I knew how to portray what society wanted me to physically. But from a, a personality standpoint, I mean, I was the one that walked into the, you know, the board meetings and just said, okay, sit down, where are my numbers? And you guys can talk about who you last weekend, some other time, let's get to work. I mean, that was me. So these guys are like, well, they're shocked, you know? And so they didn't like me very much and the women didn't like me very much. And so I thought, well, maybe that personality means that I, I was born in the wrong body. So it was all these things that were, that were culminating on top of uh, my wife was, in, I mean, over the top Catholic. She came from an Italian family. I mean, I heard the phone calls for fiery hell, burning lesbian devil. I mean, I, it, was, it was disgusting. It was horrid what they put her through. And so in turn, they kind of put me through that. And so for, for a period of time, I was really vulnerable to the idea that, yeah, that's the problem. I, I was born in the wrong body. No, the problem was, uh, was that, and I know this will probably offend some of your, from a, your viewers, but oh well, uh, yeah. we're not at a place where, where we accept homosexuality. We're just not. We're so far away from that. But the problem is, Reed, is that accepting homosexuality and accepting people that have, are same-sex attracted is a far cry from having the LGBT in our school system. You know, I mean, the LGBT went from a soft place to fall to a recruiting agency. And I don't know why we don't have more people like me standing up saying, listen, we don't have religion in schools for a good reason, because that's my, why are we so obsessed with our children's sexuality? Here's the thing. They shouldn't be having sex anyways. <laughs> you know, so the LGBT has gone from a soft place to fall. We, you know, we, for 50 years, we told people we're not after kids. We're not after kids. We're not after kids. We're not after kids. Then you had evangelicals who had too much power. Yeah. And, you know, their shit kind of rose to the top and they fell. And so now the LGBT is up here and the same thing is happening. The, the truth is, is that Reed, you need me and I need you. Yeah, we need Because you without sure. balance, what is going to happen is something freaky and something unbelievable, which is we are going to medically transition children. We're going to take 15 years off of kids' lives. We're going to cause them to have osteoporosis at 25, lungs of the size of a 12-year-old and can't run. We are causing 12, we're going to cause 12% more uh, mental health and psychosis. We're going to talk infertility. We're going to have a suicide epidemic because the day is going to come when we're going to medically transition kids. Oh, it's happened. Yeah. You know? So I, I think this is really interesting to me because it, what we have to understand is regardless of our ideological camps, I mean, let's be honest about that. Let's be open about that. Um, when you're looking at an LGBTQIA+, whatever person, evangelical Christian, somebody that's in the middle, whatever, what we have to remember is we have to remember common humanity that all of these people at the end of the day are just people even outside of our labels that we that we choose to put on our on ourselves. And if people can't agree about some basic uh, baseline common assumptions, um, and one of them being that children are young and impressionable and shouldn't be allowed to make certain decisions for themselves, 
then then I think that that, that the, really that's where we have to start. And I'll be the first to admit that uh, I don't know that Christians have done this the best way. I don't think Christians have been um, as effective as they could be and as um, explanatory as they could be from their perspective of where they come from. I do believe we've fallen into the trap sometimes of being judgmental. Uh, but by and large, I think nowadays Christians are so afraid of being called a bigot because it's and I, and this goes culturally. I mean, because the the uh, the label of racist, the label of white supremacist, white supremacist, although certainly one of the most evil things on the planet is probably the most overly used term right now in our culture. And the reason why is that it's an effective term and it is worked, I think, by and large for Christians. It shuts people up. It does. It, it shuts down conversation. And then I think the one thing that we can agree with as people going back to that whole idea is that we need to be able to have conversations about these things without calling each other names. You can catch brand new episodes of Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman every Monday and weekly bonus episodes to keep you thinking throughout the week. But you have to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new episodes drop. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like this video and share it with friends.